Welcome to Inspire 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Altrix Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Dean Stoker. Good morning. That's it. One more time. Good morning. All right. Welcome to Inspire uh, 2013. We're going to help you seize the power of strategic analytics. Welcome to Phoenix, Arizona. I'm glad to be out of Denver. It snowed the last four years, and I don't have to worry about snow this year. But we do have to worry about sharing the city with America's pastime. I don't know if you were aware of this, but starting tomorrow here at the hotel, the Sabermetrics Conference uh, uh, is coming to town, the Society of American Baseball Researchers. Pretty interesting, analytics in sports. We'll get to that a little bit later with Paul D. Podesta. The other thing that's in town is the Americans, uh, it's the International Baseball Classic. So there's teams from all over the world uh, in town. And so if you want to see an international team, you can go do that. There's also spring training from uh, Major League Baseball. Many of the teams are here. In fact, we don't want you to leave the conference to go see a game. But we know that some of you fanatics have to have your fix. So uh, Scott Jones from our sales engineering team put up a, an analytic app on gallery.alterix.com. Uh, we want you to go check it out because it's pretty cool how we did it. Built it in probably 20 minutes, published it to the cloud with a single click. And you can go and pick your favorite team, pick the day or night that you want to go see a game, and it'll come back with where you can buy tickets, where the stadium is, how long it's going to take you, directions to get there, a map, and, and so on. Just a, a, a nice little twist to getting started with uh, strategic analytics. So yesterday, we had a bunch of training sessions. How many people went to training? Oh my gosh. Okay, so note to self, lots more training next year. Uh, I heard the, the rooms were packed, standing room only. And so maybe just a, a nice round of applause for Kim Hans, Kaylin Swindle, and Richard Snow for the training. Let's <laughs> uh, get one of these. So welcome, and, and uh, we got a busy day, so we're going to go ahead and get started with, with things. Let me start by thanking a few people, and let's start with customers. Without you, we would not exist. Uh, we appreciate your business. We appreciate your support. We appreciate the advocacy you give us. We have a saying here at Alteryx that customer trust defines the integrity of our company, and we, we work to, to earn that trust each and every day. Partners, thank you for being part of our growing ecosystem. Uh, this last year, we had our channel program grew by almost 50% in revenue. Uh, beyond all expectations of what we could accomplish. And we're glad you're here to fill in the parts that we just can't get to, from domain expertise to geographic coverage to verticals that, that uh, we need your support on, on, on uh, analytic services. Prospects, boy, it's good to be you today. Uh, you are here amongst some of the brightest people around, people who have use cases that you're going to learn from, ideas that you can take back home and, and, and uh, uh, employ. Um, if you have any needs, uh, reach out to us. We'll get you connected to customers you want to talk to, partners you want to get connected with, and so on. Presenters, it's a two-edged sword, right? Um, it's gratifying to be asked to, to speak, and it's uh, difficult when they say, and your presentation has to be here by Tuesday. This is my Marco Rubio moment. I'll, pro I'll probably have a couple more of those. <coughs> Um, and finally, I want to just thank associates. Um, without associates, none of this would, would, be, a po uh, would be possible. So I want to thank all the, the associates for Alteryx and all your hard work in keeping these customers uh, happy through the years. I want to thank our sponsors. We have a huge list of sponsors this year. We're really appreciative of the fact that they, they spent their money and they brought their people to get connected with you. Uh, we share a lot of the same customers, and it's great to, to see where the, the connectivity is in the enterprise with some of our partners. And our, di our diamond category, uh, Tableau and Teradata, clearly leaders in their class from uh, visualization and data discovery for Tableau and Teradata for enterprise data warehousing and enterprise analytics. On the platinum side, Great partnerships with, a new partnership with, with Absolute Data on the service-led side of analytics and a longtime partner, uh, Jan Kessel and her team from Enveronix in, in Toronto. Gold partners, Experian, Mapping Analytics, Target Smart, TomTom Tom for everything spatial. Hortonworks, a new partner, uh, spin, a spin out of the, the uh, um, Apache 
Hadoop movement at, at Yahoo a couple of years ago, and Tango Analytics, a longtime partner as well. And on a, a silver note, uh, Revolution Analytics, helping us scale uh, the R platform for bigger ingestion of, of analytic processes. Uh, DNB, who's been with us for a long, long time, Intelytics. And a special note to, to RSI uh, Research uh, Solutions, Inc., down in the lower right. Uh, Don Penfold, most of you don't realize this, one of the tools inside of Alteryx is called Allocate for demographic reporting. The first product we ever built was, was Allocate. The only place you can actually get the Allocate UI today is through Don Penfold and his firm. We've actually blended it all inside of Alteryx and don't sell that product by itself. But if you need it, you can get it from Don Penfold. Thanks, Don. So we hear back from... Uh, customers after these conferences over the years, and we always blend your information to try to make the, the subsequent conferences more entertaining, more useful, more informative. And I want to share with you what I think our conference goals are. I hope they're in alignment with your goals because they incorporate the feedback that you gave us last year. I think most everyone wants to hear what our vision is for the future of analytics. We're going to share that with you this morning uh, and tomorrow during George's keynote. We want you to get connected to our ecosystem. It's getting bigger and broader, and it turns out there isn't one vendor that's going to meet all of your needs. You're going to need partners through the process to make sure that you're delivering on the, the promise of big data analytics. And, and so we want you to get connected to our ecosystem. The sponsor and networking lounge, most of the events we have uh, for breaks are going to be out in front of the, the SNL, so remember SNL lounge. Um, all of the partners that we just mentioned are all going to be there. If you want one-on-one -on -one sessions, let us know. If you're not sure who to talk to, we'll get you connected to, to the right people. You're going to hear a lot of use cases for Alteryx from both our, our team as well as uh, customers directly. I think there's a total of 18 uh, sessions put together by track. You're going to hear some amazing stories about performance improvements uh, in, the, in the enterprise, things that you'll definitely want to emulate as you go back home. We're going to help you Develop a strategy for customer analytics. That's kind of the focus right now. It's the big topic uh, in, in all the trade magazines, all the, the tech journals. Everyone's trying to move from big data to big data analytics and, and, and so we can get real value out of it. But that means that you're going to have to have strategies in place to know what to do next. And we think we can help you uh, get there through the, the next couple of days. Tomorrow is a great day. We are going to launch 8.5 of Alteryx. Uh, I think you're going to be really, really excited about this. We've taken a great deal of, of care this year in putting together uh, a, a, a platform that's going to extend the capabilities for data blending, for analytic processes, and for deploying analytic applications in the cloud, and with a really, really fresh, innovative, contemporary look. And I think you're going to be very excited. And this is a, a group that needs to learn as much as you teach. We, we have this, this saying in the company that when two or more people get together, you have to be willing to, to learn as much as you teach. So that means you've got to communicate. So if you would, just stand up and turn to somebody you don't know and say hello, introduce yourself if you do that. All right. <clears throat> okay. Enough communicating. <laughs> okay, folks. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> it's like it's like a term it's like a term paper where it's hard to get started but then you can't stop. <laughs> So, the last of our conference goals is really to have a little bit of fun. We've never been accused of having a bad party, so I'm going to start with the end. So tomorrow night, uh, we have an after party. Uh, it's called Party in the Park. I have, they have, they're keeping it a secret. So if you've been to any of our after parties, you know that they're, they're fun and exciting, and I'm sure this year is going to be no different. Uh, starting in the afternoon tomorrow at 3, we have a closing uh, session where we'll kind of wrap up uh, whether we met your conference goals or not. Uh, we will give some uh, awards to the Grand Prix uh, participants and the winners. We will have customer awards, partner awards, and our Associate of the Year Award because we do that together since we're all in it together, folks. We're all in it together. 
we're going to then have a, an amazing rhythm and hue uh, event. I don't know if you know David Garibaldi was on America's uh, Got Talent, one of the finalists. He does amazing artwork. And it's only fitting that this right brain guy is going to do, and he's actually got some pretty interesting left brain skills, and we're going to uh, have him on stage, and you're going to see a great show with uh, David Garibaldi. We don't want you to miss, miss uh, George's uh, keynote tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, 8-5, uh, extensive overview of what's coming. Uh, he'll have a number of, of customers and partners on the stage to go through real-world demonstrations of, of things like how we work with Hortonworks and how we work with Tableau and how we work with Teradata and their unified data architecture. So it's, it's something you, you definitely want to be at. Tonight, tonight, Wednesday, 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 is the fifth annual Alteryx Grand Prix. How many have never been to a Grand Prix, Alteryx Grand Prix? You're, you're in for a treat. So this is a our version of a hackathon, and we take, it's in a racetrack setting. Um, it is on the second floor uh, across from the partner lounge, and uh, it is a, a, a test. It is a, a test of will and skill of Alteryx users from around the world. We take 10 of the, the best data artisans that we can find uh, who are willing to go into time trials to figure out real-world business problems. And it's an amazing event. It's a great learning event. We hand out books so you can see and follow on on big screens like this exactly what everyone's doing on their machine. It's a great way to, to learn uh, uh, Alteryx processes. So I want to make sure you're there. It starts at, after the tailgate party starts at 5, 445. There'll be uh, food and, and drinks, and then we'll uh, kick off the, the Grand Prix. So. Uh, it's customary that we actually pay tribute to the prior year's winner of the Alteryx Grand Prix. So if you would, Justin Titchler of Intellitics. Uh, my name is Justin Titchler. I'm with the modeling team at Intellitics. We use it for everything. Alteryx has so many different capabilities. Uh, we rely on it a lot for spatial data processing, for handling large data sets. We use it for process automation, uh, for deployment of predictive models. We use it in reporting context. You name it, we've tried to apply Alteryx to, the, to it to help you know, make the business more efficient. On top of that, Alteryx is very easy to learn. Um, it's something that you, know, you can put a new analyst in front of and uh, within minutes have them up and running doing simple things. And you can kind of uh, very organically learn the product uh, as you use it more and more. Really, we found that Alteryx is unique in uh, not only the speed that it offers, but its scalability to large data sets and large processes, uh, its flexibility uh, in being able to uh, take lots of different disparate data elements and, and put them into one process, and also, of course, the spatial capabilities that it provides. So I personally used to use SAS any time I came across a, you know, a large data set or a large process or anything that required some type of a you know, macro programming capability. And with the macro programming capabilities that are now built into Alteryx and of course, Alteryx's ability to index large data sets and just handle a lot of data, I've moved my processes over off of SAS and onto Alteryx. The on-demand nature that the industry is moving into in general, Alteryx helps us provide solutions along those lines. Justin Titular. He's not, he is not in the event tonight, so he, there's no repeat performance. Um, but, but it's going to be a good contest, so we want you to be there. So the winner we send to Las Vegas Motor Speedway and the Mario Andretti Racing School for three days, and they get to go around the track at 160 miles an hour. And so I asked Justin, were you scared? Was it fun? He said, yeah, I got up to 160. I, I said, did anything happen? He said, yeah, a little pee came out around turn four. <laughs> An event to behold. So, a little momentum uh, discussion about uh, Alteryx. We've had an amazing 2012. We've finished our, our 16th consecutive year of, of uh, top-line growth. And I think most in, importantly, 40% of our growth of the last 16 years has, has occurred in the last 36 months. Uh, we rebranded the company at this conference in 2010. We're, we're, we're off to the races, and we thank you for all of your support in helping us get there. We started a customer... Uh, centricity program about six years ago when we had uh, uh, SAT scores 
that were in the low to middle, middle 80s, and we began to build out a customer success team. And this year we ended up with 99% SAT scores for the second year in a row. And we realized that, that SAT scores are really useful and important for, for people to know that we're there to, to support you and to help you along the way. But we knew that that wasn't enough, so we uh, took uh, the liberty of making some changes in the organization. We named Libby Duane Adams, one of our founders, as our chief customer officer, and we put together a customer experience uh, plan. Um, we, uh, uh, to kick that off at this conference last year, we started to, to tabulate a net promoter score. Uh, we finished that process back in July. We ended up with a net promoter score of 52 point, or 51.2, a uh, net promoter score being that one number that tells, you, tells us whether or not you're going to advocate for us. And it, it's true, you are advocating us. We're seeing shorter sales cycles. We're seeing greater use cases. We're seeing uh, all kinds of interesting things happen in your organization because you advocate for us. And it's also interesting that the 51.2 is twice the industry average for commercial software companies. So thank you for your support. We also knew that we hadn't updated the Ultrix UI uh, uh, since its inception back in 2006. And we knew that as we added more tools, we needed to actually make the experience easier and better for you. And in order to, to, to figure out what to do, uh, we decided to take a, a time to value survey in, in uh, two of the ECAB meetings that we had last year. And in those ECAB meetings, we found out, we asked the question, from the time you installed Alteryx, built a, a module, had a useful output to, from which you could make a, a business decision, 19% of you said you had time to value in the first 60 minutes. Pretty amazing. 22% of you had time to value in the first, 22% additional had time to value in the first three hours. And a full 40% of you had time to value in the first five days. Pretty impressive. So it made, it, it made changing the UI pretty difficult. I think you're going to be really excited about what you see tomorrow at George's presentation. 2012 was an interesting year development-wise. Our, our development team in Boulder was really, really busy. We had two major launches, uh, 7.0 and 8.0. We also had a point release, 7.1. In 7.0, we released the, the uh, we embedded the R library into Alteryx, along with lots of other uh, changes. Uh, so if you wanted to write R scripts, you, you could in, in the 7.0 product. We had Dan Putler, our product manager for, for analytics, uh, build 26 macros from, from Alteryx in 7.1 and put them into the product so that mere mortals like you and me have the ability to actually build k-means testing or linear regression or association analysis or forest analysis without actually having to do a lot of work. No data science uh, required in, in this process. In 8.0, we, we launched the uh, multi-tenant cloud service uh, called the gallery uh, at, at gallery.alteryx.com. Uh, it, it enables you, all of you who have the designer desktop have the ability to build an analytic app, publish it to the cloud with a single click, and you can do that today. I would encourage you to do that. I talked with a bunch of people yesterday that didn't know about the gallery or weren't sure where the connection points were. You might not have noticed in 8.0 many changes in the uh, designer desktop, although there were considerable changes. Most of them were invisible to you, but there was a magnificent service layer that allowed these analytic apps to move from the desktop to the cloud, again, with a single click. So not only no PhD data scientists involved, but no developers involved so that we can accelerate the, the deployment of analytic applications. And at this conference last year, we announced that we had made it to the, um, the magic quadrant for business intelligence on, on, uh, on Gartner. And it wasn't so much that we made it, but it was what you guys said about us because it's all about customer feedback and then comparing that feedback to feedback that they get from other vendors. You, you said that we were number one in uh, ad hoc queries, number one in variety of complex use cases, top tier in the amount of data ingested. Really important to hear these kinds of things. And I told you that we were hoping for northeasterly winds, and I'll show you where we ended up in this year's Magic Quadrant. Very busy year for us marketing-wise. Uh, getting through the big data discussion was somewhat challenging because everyone is in this space. And trying to clear through the air with a product and, and platform that's as powerful as Alteryx can be somewhat daunting. Our marketing team did a fantastic job at not only getting into the blogger community and the analyst community, but mainstream publications like George's write-up in, in Forbes magazine and Bloomberg. Uh, so, you know, the, the discussion around the, the predictive applications that, that allow you two to be like Nate Silver. So we really had lots of messaging breakthroughs this last year, and, it, and it's showing. It's showing in that we've got lots of new customers uh, on our docket. 
lots of new use cases as well, both from our traditional applications in geospatial as well as uh, some of the more uh, uh, modern predictive capabilities. We want to welcome Duncan Brands to the, the family. Uh, they are uh, the leader in, in quick quality restaurants. Uh, as you, you know, the Duncan Donuts brand as well as the um, uh, Baskin Robbins band, uh, brand. They're building, with the help of Tango Analytics, uh, sophisticated models to drive market performance of stored de deployment, uh, making sure that single sites are optimized, making sure that the network is optimized as they, they grow in both infill strategies on the East Coast where they're primarily located, and some of the greenfield opportunities in the West Coast. There's a lot of Bostonians in Orange County, California. We're really excited that my wife asked me to make sure that the Ultrix database included us as hyper, hyper, hyper heavy Duncan Brands users so that we could get one near our home. So Pranav, please make sure that that happens. <laughs> We're also uh, happy to, to bring uh, RentRack into the fold. Uh, they've become a new customer. Uh, this global leader in movie and, and TV content measurement is using Ultrix to modernize their analytic uh, platform offerings for multi-platform media measurement spanning, oddly enough, 85,000 movie screens across the country and 18,000 theaters, 20 million set-top boxes on television uh, viewership, and 100% of the video on demand services out there, and they're using Ultrix to improve on the insight that they're providing back to their clients, and their clients happen to be the world's largest media and entertainment company. So we're excited to have RentRec on board, solving really, really complex problems with big data. And many of you came back for more. Um, this has kind of been a secret sauce of ours for, for many years. For the analysts that are, are here, we have a net churn uh, number of 108, which is above industry averages, and that's largely because people don't leave us very often and customers always buy more. It's somewhat of a, a drug, as, as some of you have said to us. And we're excited that, that these customers have come back for more. Sprint is a customer for 10 years now, 11 years now, uh, where we're doing everything from drop call analytics in the network operations center. Uh, we are, are doing things like POPs analytics and RF engineering. And recently, we also manage all their real estate uh, assets on the ground from a, an analytics perspective. Uh, recently, they upgraded to uh, private cloud services, mostly for high intense uh, server uh, development of, of analytic apps to accelerate the development of their and the rollout of their, their uh, 4G LTE network across the country. Simultaneous to that, uh, Sprint, along with their partner uh, Ericsson, has been building the modern E911 services to, to be supported on top of that LTE network, and we're really excited about what, what folks like Sprint are doing. Can't say enough about Southern States. They're doing remarkable things with Altrix, using almost all the tools, especially the predictive tools. And uh, you'll see their uh, presentation uh, later today. I, I would encourage you to go hear it. It's a, an amazing uh, set of circumstances and, and results that have come out of it, resulting in 60% reduction in catalogs that they've had to mail out and a, an improvement of 34% lift in their response rates. So things that you don't normally hear about in, in the predictive world, they're using and leveraging Altrix in uh, significant ways. And Levi Strauss, who's, and you thought they were just selling dungarees. They're actually really, they're really involved in analytic processes. For years, they've been using Altrix to mitigate uh, channel conflict and having too many stores selling their items uh, too close together. Uh, they've now adopted Ultrix private cloud services because they're beginning to deploy analytic applications to all the people who are asking questions uh, in their business, really helping support their customer uh, analytics initiatives. And yes, uh, for the second year in a row, we made it to the uh, Gartner Quadrant. This is the official quadrant that I can show you. There's a lot more to this. Gartner's pretty picky about what we, we can illustrate. But we got our wish. We had northeasterly winds. We were smack dab in the middle of the niche quadrant last year. We moved uh, very close to the, the edge um, uh, on the right. We are the most visionary in the niche quadrant. We moved up in terms of our execution as well. But what's most important about the quadrant is the fact that they changed the name of it. It's no longer the business intelligence platform quadrant. They've expanded it to include the BI and analytics platform quadrant, signaling a, a trend that I think you all see in your businesses, a move from traditional rear view mirror dashboard reporting capabilities, 
that we typically find in stack vendors, to the insight side of things with great data discovery and visualization tools, to tools that would allow you to understand what's going to happen next, the, the foresight that you need to run your businesses. And we're really excited about this. We're also excited about what they said. And what they said all came from you. We, we appreciate the, the things that you've passed on to them. You said, you said and they reported, Ultrix transitioned itself from a, from a more narrowly scoped platform focused primarily on developing geographic-based analytic apps to a more broadly scoped platform that can be applied to a broader array of analytic ap applications. Strong data integration foundation that enables significant external content. Ultrix provides robust ad advanced analytic capabilities through the integration with R and previous pre-built tools for predictive analytics. Ultrix ranks second highest among all vendors when customers were asked about the extent to which they use the platform to perform complex analyses, and it goes on and on and on. So um, for, oops, sorry about that. So for uh, all of your support, I want to thank you for giving us good feedback on the, on the MQ. So you're asking, how does that fit into big data? What is this big data space all about? We, we've all been hearing about it, right? You, you can't ignore it. It's, it's, it seems to be everywhere. Well, we know that the big data space is pretty broad. Anyone who touches it, creates it, moves it, stores it, converts it, protects it, virtualizes it, everybody's involved in big data. There isn't a tech player out there that isn't involved in it. Part of it's because they, they want to make sure that they're part of the conversation, even if they don't really do those things. And it makes it challenging for lots of companies. But it's more than just a big ecosystem of, of people playing in the big data space. It's big money. Uh, last year, VCs and, and private equity firms put $2.5 billion into the big data space with all kinds of new startups that they hope to, to get to success at some point in time. And it's not just about big money, it's about big media. I mean, you open up any of the pages you, you watch on the web and it's all about big data. And thousands of bloggers and, and analysts writing about big data and where it's going. In fact, there were people at the end of the year trying to change the conversation to small data. It's really about small data. And one guy wrote about long data. We, we need to focus in on long data because customer analytics is all about tracking customers over time. And they weren't very successful in this, although I think they're probably just as, as correct. Two of my favorite in the media space uh, tracking big data was the Wall Street Journal back in the fall that came out in big, bold letters. I think it was the, the front page of the... Wall Street Journal and said, big data is the new boss. Big data is the new boss. Shortly after that, we saw all kinds of CIOs and CMOs scramble to put in big Hadoop infrastructures because nobody wants to be disintermediated by the elephant in the room, especially when the elephant is named Hadoop. And, and I, I, think, I think that's the right approach. I think they did the right thing, a reactionary at the time. In the long haul, it might not necessarily pan out to, to provide the most value. The other one that I found very, very interesting was Harvard Business Review who came out and, and said, you know, it's big data, it's now it's all about science. It's about big science and data science is the, 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 the new word. They came out in, a, in an article and said, data scientist is the new sexy. Data scientist is the new sexy. Imagine that. But I think, I think big data's got a blind spot. I think it has a big blind spot. No matter who you talk to, only 5% of corporate data actually gets analyzed to any great degree. Most will tell you that only one half of 1% of web-created content gets analyzed at all. In an MIT survey uh, last year uh, of a few hundred CIOs, they said that only 6% of the firms that had big data efforts actually saw any marginal improvement in business performance. Some are talking about a big data bubble. Gartner has the uh, hype cycle on big data, and they actually have it on most of the technology trends. And they track the evolution of, of the discussion. And this was their first year in 2012, the hype cycle on big data, and MapReduce, kind of the foundation of, of Hadoop, is already in the trough of dis disillusionment. What's wrong with this picture? They're, they're actually predicting that the hype cycle for big data might go away in just a couple of years. Probably the shortest hype cycle ever. 
So what's the disconnect here? We know we want business performance. We know the data. The, the data at this point is table stakes. It's always going to get bigger. So we have to focus on something different if we're going to get to performance. This is what I think it is. We've been focused on the right letter, but we've been focused on the adjectives. The volume of data, the velocity of data, the variety of data. We know that it exists out there. It's not changing. It's just going to get bigger, and it's going to get more varietal, and it's going to get uh, uh, faster as, as things move along. So what we need to do is focus on really value. We have to turn it into a noun, and we've got to focus in on how is this big data going to influence our business? Where are we going to get value in ingesting all this information, making sense out of it, applying analytic processes to it, so that we can connect the answers to the questions that are being asked that drive your business? So I would like to spend the next few minutes talking about the consumerization of analytics. And I know you're thinking, oh, Dean, Dean, this is one of those grandiose plans and this future vision and it's never going to happen and another cockamamie story about how, how we're going to get there. Or it's a succinct description of the inevitable. I actually think that's what it is. It is a succinct description of the inevitable. Why? In this ever growing complexity world that we live in, we're always looking to simplify. We are always looking to simplify. Take a look at our personal lives and our professional lives. In our personal lives, we live in what I'll call an instant America. You get up at home, you have an interesting question, you Google it, I'm looking for purple monsters. And you can get back, it, honestly I did this just to make sure that purple monsters came back. You can get back everything about purple monsters. Where to find one, where to buy one, where to price shop one where to make one, where to import one, where to export one, where to trade one for an orange one, where to date one, where to buy a Russian one. It, it, it's, it's amazing. And you know what? We don't so much care about the, we don't care so much about the answer because we have speed and we can iterate the question to whittle it down into the right answer. And we do that all the time. Speed's important. We know that. Uh, Google has three billion searches a day and they say if the search for the answer to the question you asked comes back one half of a second later, there's eight million fewer searches a day. Boy, you're an impatient bunch. And so you think about maybe monetization of time is important. Amazon says that if a page comes back in certain conditions, if a page comes back for a product search in more than a second, they could lose up to $1.6 billion in retail sales. We know that speed is important. So when I hear people in the business sector saying, ah, it takes me three months and that's okay. That is not okay. There is nothing that should take three months. And so speed is important. But we also want value. And so nothing irks me more than having to type in the same question over and over with one word change. Orange monsters or blue monsters. We all, we're an app-driven society now. Guess how many apps have been downloaded off of just the Apple Store? 40 billion. Four zero. 20 billion just in the last year. We are app, how many people have apps on their phone? So we are an app-driven society. We all have our favorites. Here's, here's my favorite. Drives me nuts. Driving to work. I hear a song that I really like. I have a terrible memory. I find myself writing down some words and I get to the office and I try and Google it and then I, I'm not sure I get the right one. I get the wrong one two or three times. I finally find it. I go to the iTunes store. I download it and what a hassle. What a hassle. So what did I do? I got Shazam. I got Shazam and I drive to the office now and I just do this to my phone and it downloads the music and it is awesome. I can sing along and I no, no longer have to stop mid-sentence and say, na 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 I actually know the words now. We have been apt and we have been Googleized. Now let's take a look at the other side of it, our professional work. I'll call that the distant America. You get into the office and you have presumably more complex questions and more important questions than where can I find a purple monster or what song's playing on the radio. Questions like, how do I optimize my 
media mix when I have online and offline channels? How do I make sure that my retail floor space management program is keeping the right products in the right sizes and the right quantities and the right colors on the shelf as I invite my most loyal customers into the store to buy them? How do I allocate my on-the-ground resources to make sure that my return on invested capital meets corporate expectations when I'm trying to grow 300 stores a year and my network is already existing of 6,000 stores a year and changing every day? These are hard problems. And what do you do? So you get up and you call a meeting. I got these questions, I need some answers. And we have to have this meeting in the auditorium because there's lots of people involved. I got to call IT. I got to call the data team. Because it's the data team, I got to call the data governance team. I got to bring in developers. I got to bring in UI experts. I got to bring process engineers. And this is a long, long cycle. I have a, a product requirements document. There's a statement of work. There's a technical specification. I do waterfall development. And in nine months, I get the answer to the question that I no longer need. I'm on to the next question. We live in an instant America, and we live in a dis distant America. The other question is, how do we know it's consumer? How, how do we know it's the consumerization of analytics and not the consumerization of something else? IBM did a study of uh, CIOs last year as well, and the evidence was overwhelming. CIOs said analytics were the number one factor, number one factor contributing to an organization's competitiveness. I don't know if your company is data-driven, if it's fact-based decisioning that you're relying on, if it's trying to get to big data analytics, but I assure you, if you're not, you won't be a contender. You will not be a contender. So you're saying, okay, Dean, you got this big notion of consumerizing analytics. I'm sure you're now going to tell us how Altrix is going to save the day. Well, I'm not going to tell you that Altrix is the right strategic analytics platform when put in the hands of line of business analysts that allow them to do unlimited data blending, adding context to that content, engaging in simple to complex spatial and predictive modeling, and then deploying it to the cloud with a single click. I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> I am going to tell you that I actually think Altrix is the Shazam of big data analytics. I really do. I really do. And I think you know that. I'm not here to tell you about technology. I'm here to talk with you about you. I actually think you're the linchpin in big data analytics. It's not us. I, I admit that great technology is important. But if you want to get to the right level, you have to have great drivers for great technology, and, and that's you. You're the data artisan. I think you're the new boss. I think you're the new sexy. Don't listen to what you hear out there. It's a lot easier than you think. You are this close to the consumerization of analytics. But you have a tough job. There's not a lot of self-help books. Think about this. The average male his age weighs 175 pounds, consumes 2,500 pounds of food a year, seven, eight pounds of food a day, oddly enough. If you want to get value out of your diet, you want to blend the food. You want to mix it in the right portions and the right ingredients to, to get the right proteins and the right kinds of carbs and you want to feel good during the day when you're going to these big staff meetings with all these people. <laughs> and in order to get value out of that diet, you have tons of help. There's thousands of cookbooks and recipes. There's online, there's a zillion. If you just type in chicken enchiladas like I did last Christmas, there's like 10,000 recipes for chicken enchiladas. I never actually knew. So there's also recipes on every container of food you buy. I didn't know there was so many things you could do with Jell-O. Just look on, the, on the, the back of these things. You can get value out of the food you ingest. Well, think about the other side of it. The average male has a head that weighs 10 pounds. 
University of California, San Diego reported that, and this is actually about two and a half years ago, this study, so I'm sure the data is much, much bigger. Uh, they reported that uh, Americans consume nearly 3.6 zettabytes of data per day, for the, the equivalent of 14 average hard disk drives of information for every man, woman, and child. I figure it's probably big hard drive today for you, probably nine or 10 hours of work day for you. It's hours and hours of emails and tweets and Facebook information and LinkedIn profiles and, and Yelp accounts and, and POS data and um, information that's in your, your uh, data marts and your data stores, both structured and unstructured. And yet there's not a single bit of help that you get to help you blend all this information together. Not a single bit. Well, actually, there's two books that have been written that would help you out, not thousands of them. There's just two. One was written in 1954 called How to Lie with Statistics. We're not going to go there with that one. The second book that's been written, we wrote, and it's going to be handed out tomorrow at George's keynote, a big data analytics book. But it's not for you because you're the new boss. It's for your boss. Give them these books after you get them tomorrow, and I think you'll see huge changes in your operation. And why is this important? Well, as we go down this continuum of, of translating content, data, into information, into knowledge, ultimately into solutions, I think a lot of people think you need more people. You need more human involvement. I, I actually think it's the complete opposite. There aren't enough data scientists in the world to solve this world's problems. So we have to actually have technologies that are in the right people's hands. We, we actually need different kinds of, of resources uh, put on these problems today. We need left brain skill sets. We know that. If you're going to get involved in any sort of intense analytic process, uh, you're going to need the ability to dream up hypotheses, create data tables from which you can test those hypotheses, to build models, and maybe not write R or, or SAS code, but the ability to call up a, a simple macro that allows you to throw all the data in and munge the information. And then if you need help with the R-square or whatever the, the result happens to be, you can get that help. So we know left brain skills are important. But we have to consider the kinds of questions that are being asked and who's asking the question. It used to be that the CIO would ask the question or the CFO would ask the question. Everyone's asking the questions today. Why? Because they've been Googleized. They get up in the morning and they type questions, that, and that's what they're doing in business. They're coming from line managers, from warehouse managers, from salespeople, from marketing managers, from brand managers. It's coming from all over the place. And so you need to have right brain skills in order to do the right things around adding context, enhancing the style, and creating metaphors that people can understand when the question or the answer to the question gets delivered. This is the data artisan. It's not more, more people. It's not more humans. It's more of the right human. So we've been testing this theory around data artisans, and I'm not sure if everyone completely believes it. I think we've uh, had a, a bunch of people say, ah, data scientists, that's the way to go. It sounds, it sounds better, and you know, they're already been announced as the, the new sexy. There's only 12 data scientists in the world, and they're off making that data science calendar somewhere. So we, ha we have to fill in with... with <laughs> Now, it would amaze me if, if we had a, a Sports Illustrated data science collection. I don't know. I, I, I think that data artisan works quite well. And how do I know that? I've been testing this. I go on lots of calls with customers, and I test this all the time. Kath, Catherine DeSessa uh, from BPN uh, has been a customer of ours for quite some time. And uh, she wrote to me a couple weeks ago, and she said, I have to realize that data artisan truly describes what I do every day. Data artisan means more than statistician because they do more than compare groups to test hypotheses. Data artisan means more than data scientists, because I do more than build databases and OLAP tools. And while data miner just doesn't sound nearly so sophisticated, don't be surprised if you see more of us adopting this title. Several of my colleagues have commented on how well the name really fits us. I really do think it fits you. In fact, what's even more to the point of using Alteryx if you're a data artisan, Libby Duane went to visit uh, TBC a couple of weeks ago, and the data artisans at TBC said, 
you know, I don't, I don't want to give you guys at Alteryx a big head, but I really love your software. And you know why? I love your software because it rewards me for the way I think. But you've got a big road ahead. You've got to take down a couple of barriers, three barriers actually, if you want to get to the consumerization of analytics. The first of those is we have to somehow humanize big data. We have to figure out how to blend it and organize it and make sense out of it and add context to it. Mark Smith of Ventana Research did some, some work last summer. He presented at some of our live events around the country. And uh, Mark did a study of the analytic process. And he wanted to find out how analysts spend their time. <laughs> Oddly, and I'm sure some of you, when you, before using Alteryx, you have this exact same experience. He found out that analysts spend 69% of their time in the analytic, uh, uh, I'm sorry, they, of, of the time they spend in the analytic process, 69% of the time is actually not on the process at all. It's actually data blending. It has nothing to do with the data process. It has to, get, it has to, to do with getting ready for the analytic process. And let's, let's go ahead and investigate why we think this is. Well, we know the data is getting bigger. It's coming from every form factor. Last, last year, there were 2.8 million petabytes of content produced around the world. Quite a bit. And it's not slowing down. By the end of the decade, they're, they're expecting 40 million petabytes a year being produced. 40 million petabytes. 90% of the world's content has been produced in just the last two years. So get over the big data thing, right? It's getting bigger. Just, we're going to have to figure out. It's table stakes. We're going to have to figure out how to contend with it. And it's not just the, the devices that are creating all this. I always worry, you know, when I get up in the morning and push the coffee pot. I'm, I'm wondering, who's getting this information from, you know, the... What are they doing with it? And is it ever going to come back to me in some sort of value with a better user experience on my coffee pot? And hopefully that's the case as we get involved in customer analytics, maybe through your, your smart meter on your, on your home. But the data is also being created in the cloud, which makes it a little bit more difficult. It's not even in your possession behind your firewall anymore. I got my CRM up in Salesforce. I got my ERP up in NetSuite. I've got my marketing content in Marketo. I, I'm calling APIs from Microsoft's Azure site. I'm, I'm sharing... POS data with my retail supply chain off of Amazon S3, and it's, it's daunting what's going on in the space. So what has everyone done? Well, I think the early movers in the big data world got a little bit nervous. They were unsure of what to do. Uh, so they went out and started stockpiling data. They were standing up Hadoop clusters everywhere. Not that that was the wrong move. I think that was a, a noble early move, and maybe the appropriate move for lots of people. And they did so because I think the, the thought was that Hadoop is free. It's open source. It's as free as a free puppy. <laughs> got to water it three times a day. I got to feed it five times a day. I got to take it out to do its business ten times a day. And God forbid it gets run over in the street. A lot of upkeep which is why we're so excited about partnerships like Hortonworks, commercial distribution of Hadoop, giving us a lot more scalability, giving us a lot more uh, insight into how to support these kinds of systems. And it's not just about standing up uh, Hadoop clusters and, and thinking that the one with the most content wins. I think it's about carefully architecting plumbing in the data warehouse to make sure that structured data can coexist with semi-structured data, and it can coexist with unstructured data, and I can move data from one place to another depending on what I'm doing to that information and storing it in the place that's most appropriate. And I think that the organization that's been able to move from this old stack to the new stack better than anybody else, certainly, certainly the early movers in the space, is Teradata, world leaders in enterprise data warehousing. They put together a unified data architecture. You're going to hear from Bill Franks a little bit later on about this. You're going to actually see this tomorrow in George's presentation, how we're, uh, we've become the analytic layer in the line of business on top of the UDA. So you no longer have to worry about pulling data out. You can actually just push your algorithms in, and you get the scalability of the database, and you have the structured and unstructured data to support the decision-making that you're trying to get to. So I guess what I was trying to illustrate here is that in the micro-marketing world that I grew up in, in the 80s, 
It was all about finding the needle in the haystack. And it was pretty easy. You had one data stream usually. You had some POS data on it, and you, had, you could use a microscope to figure out who our best customers were from an RFM perspective or customer lifetime value perspective. But today it's different. It's every source of data, and that missing piece of data might be the most critical piece that I need in order to show value for, for my programs. And that means I have to see the whole, say, the whole haystack. I need a macroscope. I don't need a microscope. And that's what this is all about, allowing Ultrix to, to, to act as the microsco microscope, as the shazam to get to the content that matters most for you. We have spent a lot of time this last year making sure that experience works for you. We've put together lots of cloud connectors so that if your data is in Amazon, you can read and write to it. MongoDB for NoSQL environments that a lot of people have stood up. Salesforce, uh, the most popular cloud CRM. Uh, and we use these tools ourselves, so, so we experiment on our own databases when we, we build, build these tools out. How about the, the most popular content management platform out there, SharePoint? So we now support reading and writing of, of SharePoint lists, bulk loaders for Teradata, and the ability to, to tap into almost any database, either through direct drivers or OLADB or ODBC connectivity to, to these databases. We want your experience to be fantastic inside of Altrix so that you can see the whole haystack. This last year, we also added third-party content because we know that you have to add context to what's in your database. If you need ground truth. You need to know what your customers are like demographically, behaviorally, uh, what their incomes are and their ages and their races and where they live. Spatial is, is kind of how we grew up, and we believe that everything that happens in business happens somewhere. You'd be surprised at how many applications aren't being used today in, in the private sector uh, where Spatial actually has huge improvements in, in uh, biz business benefit. And Dun & Bradstreet for firmographic information, the same uh, notion. So we're really excited about the content that we've put together. And I think our point around this is that it's not about how much data you've got, it's about how much context you give it. And you can have a dump truck, and it wouldn't be bad, but you might want a smart car to get you there faster. So once we get you through that hurdle of humanizing big data, so we have all the abilities for you to do this very easily without having to have a bunch of people in data integration teams you know, helping you out, we have to get through what we call the liberation of analytics. Why do we need to do this? In that same IBM survey that I, I uh, cited earlier, that, that CIOs ranked analytics the number one factor contributing to an organization's overall competitiveness, they also said this. They said that enterprises that apply advanced analytics have 33% more revenue growth and 12 times the profit growth than organizations that don't use analytics. Those are pretty compelling numbers. How, how could you not want to engage in analytic processes? They said organizations that embrace analytics are twice as likely to outperform their peers, and the top performers use analytics more than five times that of low performers. Pretty powerful right? So how do we do all this? We use analytic processes inside of Alteryx or whatever other tool that, that you can find that gives you the shazam. Now, we don't, don't always agree on what analytics are. I think it's kind of like big data. It's in the, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Analytics to me are a full range, a continuum of simple to complex. Arithmetic formulas, they might be complex mathematical calculations or financial calculations. It could be genetic algorithms running in a, a gravity model inside of Alteryx to, to make sure that you have the right uh, asset allocation on, on the surface of the earth. It might be statistical processes or even predictive al algorithms that help you get to what's going to happen next, that foresight that we talk about in, in traditional BI. And while we might not always agree on what analytics are, I think we all recognize when they're absent. Now, I think you probably followed the subway debacle over the 11-inch foot long. Now, I don't know if that's really an analytics problem. Maybe, maybe in portion control, analytics could have been, been a little bit uh, more detailed. But marketing pulled them out of the, out of the mud and said, Footlong is a trade name only and not to be a unit of measure. So, 
Thumbs up for marketing. <laughs> now, we always talk about the, the, the importance of having analytics to drive value in our business, but we don't always think about the cost of not having analytics in our business. You don't have to look very far past the 787 and what's happened there with the batteries. I can't wait to fly in one of those, but apparently I'm going to have to. Um, all, all Nippon Airways is the largest fleet owner of 787s. They just announced that they're tarmacking their entire fleet until May 30th. And I'm sure this is a complex problem. I'm not trying to minimize it. But I just somehow think that a couple of data artisans with the right tools, maybe with some electrical engineering skills, could have solved this problem. And you know what it's costing them? A million dollars a day just for all Nippon Airways. It's a $100 million problem. And that's not counting the disruption of their personnel, the chaos of passengers, the, the retrofitting of their fleets around the world. This is a big problem. So we need to start thinking about not only the value of the analytics we have, but the cost of the, an the analytics that we decide not to engage in. We set out on a path last year with the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit. We wanted to put together an infographic and we wanted to, to base it around research we had done to figure out where the gap was between where people felt they didn't have big data analysis capabilities and where they thought that the best value would be in big data analysis capabilities. And it came back just as we suspected. It's everything about customers, everything about call centers, everything about marketing programs, uh, all, all the way down to strategy. So we, we believe that this is all about um, customer analytics. Gartner said that by 2017, if you have any doubts about customer analytics as being the driver, by 2017, chief marketing officers will spend more, a lot more, on IT infrastructure than CIOs. Imagine that. Oops, let's go back one, I'm sorry. So this past year, we spent a lot of time on, on uh, tools inside of Alteryx, mostly the predictive tools. We, I think we're up to something like 30 uh, predictive tools. All the things that are really hard to write scripts are in, in R or in certainly in SAS code, we made really easy. So mere mortals can do it. And because the tools, and, uh, the tools are getting more expansive and the questions are getting more broad, we decided in the news interface that we had to have a big canvas for you to paint. And you'll see more of this in George's presentation tomorrow, just a little teaser about the new UI of Alteryx. Pretty impressive. I think you're going to be very excited about just the logic of it, the, the contemporariness of it. So I'm pretty excited for you to, to, to be there. So we know customer analytics are important. But it's also a challenge because there's kind of a bifurcation in, in the vendor community around customer analytics. So if, if you, want to, you want to engage in pricing optimization, yeah, there's a whole bunch of point solutions that you can go buy, applications. And if you want to go get market basket analytics, there's another set of usually separate vendors who have market basket spend analytics. If you want to do site location modeling, there's a bunch of other vendors that support that from a software perspective. Very few analytics platforms. There's Alteryx. There's, I'm not even sure I'd call SAS the platform. But those are your, kind, of, kind of your choices. So you, you can either man up and have dozens of people running point solutions, blow your budget, still have the, the problems of data blending and analytic production and the, the publishing of it, or you can buy platforms like Alteryx. And it's not just soft, it's not a, a technology-led environment only. In fact, a lot of our growth this last year was through service-led approaches. There's a burgeoning community of analytic consultants who will help you get through this process. One of those consultants is, is a partner of ours, Absolute Data. Worldwide, dealing with Fortune 500 companies all over the world, helping them clear the air and get to analytic processes that matter. They're working with one of our longtime customers, Carol Anderson by invitation, Cabby Short. Many of the women here might know Cabby as a fashion a women's fashion uh, apparel multi-level marketing organization. 
really sophisticated processes in which they're, which they're doing. And, and Absolute is building models that help predict where they should have consultants on the ground and how many consultants they can have to make sure they don't saturate the marketplace, making sure that they can make money in the process, both them and their consultants, driving a demand surface so we know that there's enough women to have these home parties to drive success for the organization and to make these women look great in the cabbie apparel. So we really appreciate what Absolute Data is doing uh, around the analytic process. But there's also, there's also a different kind of or a different level of consulting engagement. Lots of big organizations aren't ready to take the plunge. They aren't ready to necessarily buy a platform. Or they have other platforms that don't work. They don't want to buy point solutions generally. They're trying to figure out, what should my strategy be around customer analytics? What should I invest in? How do I know there's going to be a return on my investment? Because it's going to be big, because we know analytics is the number one factor driving uh, business performance. And so a lot of our customers will call on BCG, Boston Consulting Group. And they've been a, a great partner in just a short period of time. So I wanted to welcome Cornelius Kastner to the stage. Cornelius. <laughs> Cornelius, welcome to Phoenix. Glad you're Thank here. You. Happy to be here. Much warmer than Washington, D.C. today. Uh, you probably can't get back home, can you? Not today, no. There's a ball game for him. I know that. So. Tell the audience a little bit about uh, BCG, the, the overall spectrum of businesses, and then where your analytics practice fits in. Sure. So the Boston Consulting Group is one of the world's leading consulting firms. We've got 5,500 consultants across uh, 40, 77 countries and 42 offices, uh, working in every industry, every function. You know, our aim is to be the top on the top of the, or working on problems that are the top of the CEO's agenda. And as you mentioned, analytics that's coming up more and more. And so what we're finding is in our analytics efforts, we've really got to be positioned in how do we help companies think about what, how they bring analytics and new approaches to solve their business problems, I would say is, is one piece of our analytics efforts. And the other piece is how do we make our consultants more capable in this space? So you talk about humanizing analytics before, there's an internal effort around that as well. Interesting. So you sent a, a, an associate to our conference last year. Yes, we did. Within a couple of weeks after the conference, you purchased... Uh, three seats of Alteryx. Mm -hmm. You're now at 100 seats of Alteryx. Give us a sense of the variety of use cases that, that your consultants are going through with customers, if you can. Sure. So three quick examples. One is uh, helping a retailer figure out exactly which SKUs to put in their circulars. So not a lot of post-event assessment or predictions about, about what kind of SKU is going to do well. So that, that's a big opportunity. One was around helping retail or helping a, a, a technology company th figure out how do they predict when their servers crash. So looking across event logs, not just for, for the server, but actually across a wide set of, of infrastructure pieces in their, in their network. And then a, a third example is, is helping a, an airline think about how do, we, how do we build a loyalty program that rewards customers for what they're about to do and not what they did with us in the previous year. Interesting. Can, can you d dive a little bit deeper into one of those? to give us some ROI perspective in what you're Absolutely. saying? Absolutely. So, so the promotional effectiveness one is where we're seeing a very, very quick RO, a very, very quick return on value, very, very high ROIs. So at one retailer, we found that about half of their promotions had no impact on the top line. And this is a country in Europe that's really struggling, and so top line is, is their number one, number one objective. Mm -hmm. And so by actually taking away the bad promotions and putting in the good promotions, we found that there's a billion dollars of top line value. Wow. Billion dollars. Billion dollars. So clearly your customers are seeing value in, in the work you're doing. What value are, are your consultants driving with Alteryx for BCG? Yeah, so the, the nice thing f for us, and, and this is why the adoption has been so fast in the last, in particular in the last couple of months where we really have accelerated and, and brought it out, is what we're able to do is distribute the thinking around analytics to the people who are closest to the business problems. So our, our focus is to get as many consultants up and running with Alteryx as possible, so that when they do encounter big data, large analytics types problems, there's good applications for the predictive tool set that they can solve those problems on their own with all the right business context versus having somebody at the center try to figure out what is the right thing that might be relevant for a customer. So data artisan resonates. Absolutely, absolutely. Interesting. So um, the road ahead, what, where does Alteryx fit in BCG's uh, future plans? So, I mean, my perspective is you talked about how there's going to be more and more data. You know, 20 years ago, 
Excel helped revolutionize what people could do with analytics and, and what, what they could conceptualize and how they could model things. I think Alteryx is, is ready to do that for us over the course of the next decade. So I can certainly imagine that 10 years from now, everybody has Alteryx type capabilities on their desktop ready to uh, tackle any analytical problem they could face. Beautiful, beautiful. Cornelius, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. for your business. <clears throat> A billion dollars, driving value for sure. So the last hurdle is one you probably think is the most difficult. It's actually the easiest, and it's going to be very short. It's about connecting all the work that you've done heretofore with the person asking the question. Actually, go back a slide if you would. A couple of facts that you should know about, about this. In that infographic that we created, uh, the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit, we asked executives about some things and they reported that 77% of executives said more employees needed access to big data. 64% of them said decisions would improve if more people had access to big data. You know, we did a uh, customer advisory board um, la a couple of months ago and we asked some questions around who consumes the analytic processes that you, you build? And we were not very surprised by the outcome. It was very similar to the Economist uh, reports. We found that 85% of you who use Alteryx produce analytics for internal departments and their staffs. You're not producing analytics for yourself. 65% said they produce analytics for com uh, company leadership teams. And 35% for external teams, extended enterprise teams. So we know that, that putting the answers into the hands of the people asking the questions is very important. And we know we're impatient. And we, we probably will, will never get to, you know, Siri, tell me how many blue sweaters I should have on the shelf in store 42 today. We probably won't ever get there. But we can get to an analytic process that's very, very powerful, that gives you an app experience in a Google-like environment. How do we do that? The Alteryx technology provides it today. So you can take your analytic process, write a simple user interface around it without writing a line of code, a simple extension to the workflow that you've already created. You can push that process in a scheduled environment back to your database if that's the destination for the person who is asking the question. It can be a, an SMTP supported email that goes to these nine people if this condition occurs as a, a, you know, a pie chart in the body of the email and a PDF of things that you don't want them to, to change. It can be almost any metaphor that the right brain data artisan creates. It can be private cloud. So when you publish an Alteryx app to the cloud, it sends, it sends the, the API with it, a REST API so that you could call it in another user interface. No code writing at all, pretty simple. You can call the API natively if you're going to develop mobile applications. Experian rolled out an app on the iTunes uh, uh, store last year that allowed somebody to say, hey, I'm standing right here. Is this a good location for a retail store? What's going to be the sales prediction here? We're getting to that app experience. And in fact, probably best noted is the work we did in, in Alteryx 8.0. We rolled out the multi-tenant analytics gallery sitting up in uh, Amazon Web Services. Actually, you see the, the spring training app that's up there. So if you want to go to a ball game, international teams or, or Major League Baseball teams, you can do so. You have the ability to use this today. I think that you, know, you all have 10 seats tied to your desktop, the designer desktop. Build an app and publish it up. It's really not very hard. Share it with your teams. You're, you're going to find out that you really are the new boss. You're going to find out that you really are the new sexy. We're really excited about this relationship, Tableau. I said at this conference last year, if you're an Alteryx user, well, we talked about visualization quite a bit, and, and I'll just tell you straight out that if you're an Alteryx user today, you no longer have to sacrifice beauty on the altar of analytics. We now support with eight... eight uh, uh, 8.5, uh, production of a Tableau data ex extract directly into Tableau 8, which is coming out soon. We're really excited about this. We have lots of joint customers, and when you add their da data discovery and visualization uh, to Alteryx, power is there. 
You'll actually see this in a demonstration in George's keynote tomorrow. Uh, I think they're probably showing some things in the Solution Center as well. So that's it, the consumerization of analytics. Not some pipe dream, just a simple statement about the inevitable. It's going to happen, and you can either wait for it or you can drive it. So before I introduce our keynote speaker, let me end on just this thought. If there's one slide that I want you to take back to your team, your boss, your committee, whoever sent you here, and, and they ask you, what did you learn? This is what you want to show them. This is the cliff note presentation of what I just gave. Alteryx is that single platform for big data analytics, sitting in the line of business, allowing the data artisan with left brain, right brain skills to be able to blend any data, give it context, apply a full range of analytic processes to it, from simple to spatial to predictive, and then the ability to publish it to the people who matter most, the ones making the decisions, 